Welcome to the special session of Sipe World Cup 2011. Please welcome the chairman of Sipe Worldwide Board of Directors, Doug McMillan. Good afternoon, everyone. How are we doing? So far, so good today? Great. Well, listen, we're going to take a little bit of time now and uh, conduct a panel discussion. And I'm, I'm excited about doing that. And our topic today is harnessing the creative power of entrepreneurship and business to eliminate poverty, improve communities, and make the world a better place. Who can argue with that? Sound like a good topic? It's a broad one. <laughs> um, the real power of business in this space is finding the overlap between the needs of the world and the demands of business. And I can tell you from personal experience at Walmart that what we've learned, especially over the last few years, is that when we align financial, social, and environmental sustainability, good things happen. And it is possible to find that alignment. We've found places as we've um, made progress towards three big goals of being supplied by renewable energy, by creating zero waste, and by selling more sustainable products. What we found is that increases our relevance with customers. It helps us attract and retain talent because people want to have that kind of purpose in the work that they do. And it helps us save money. We become more efficient. So we can talk some more about that later if, if you'd like to because we're going to open this up at the end to field any questions that you have. I've also got a, a few questions from Facebook and we'll, we'll fire those at the panelists. But let me uh, go ahead and get our panelists to come and, and join me on the stage. I'll introduce them one at a time. Our first one is Rupendra Singh. As the head of KPMG, As the head of the KPMG Foundation for India, our first speaker is responsible for leading CSR initiatives in the areas of development, environment, and education in one of the world's fastest growing economies and largest population areas. Rupendra Singh is a graduate of Delhi, of the University of Delhi, and trained as a chartered accountant in London with Touche and Ross, which is now Deloitte and Touche, before returning to India to help set up the offices of this big four firm. Later, he was part of a team of partners that helped establish the operations for KPMG India. He's also set up and led the firm's forensic and business, business ethics practices, served as the head of audit and later as chief operating officer, retiring as non-exec chairman in 2008. Rupendra is a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales, a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, and has served on the board of governors of the local chapter of the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners and Institute of Internal Auditors. In addition to his many professional activities, Rupendra has served as the Vice Chairman of SIFE in India and is currently a trustee of the Prince's Youth Business International in the UK. Please help me welcome to the stage Rupendra Singh, Chairman of the KPNG India Foundation. <laughs> The next speaker plays too many roles and has received far too many awards for me to come close to introducing him properly. Doug Pitt is an entrepreneur, international philanthropist, community leader, amateur photographer, and most recently has become an executive consultant for SIFE Worldwide, where he leads our information technology functions. Doug is a graduate of Missouri State University in the U.S. and has uh, made his home in Springfield, Missouri. As an entrepreneur first, Doug is the co-founder and owner of Service World Computer Center, Service World Business Solutions, and Intech Tanzania. He's been recognized in the Springfield community as the Small Business Person of the Year by the Chamber of Commerce, and nationally as Small Business Person of the Year nominee by the United States Small Business Association. Beyond the business world, Doug has applied his creative vision and entrepreneurial talent to tackle a number of local, regional, national, and international development and humanitarian issues. With support from a Springfield business leader, Jim Morris, and his brother, Brad Pitt, and the Jolie Pitt Foundation. Have you ever heard of those people? <laughs> yeah. Um, Doug founded Care to Learn, a nonprofit dedicated address to addressing emergent needs of K-12 students in the areas of health, hunger, and hygiene. He's also a recognized leader on the critical issue of water shortage and serves as a director of WorldServe International and Africa 6000 International. 
Doug is and has been actively involved in a number of notable organizations such as the Rotary Club, CASA, Make-A-Wish Foundation, Red Cross, Big Brothers and Sisters, and Easter Seals. This guy's busy. Additionally, he and his family support several local universities, hospitals, economic development organizations, and community service initiatives. Doug has been recognized prominently for his service and achievements, most recently as the 2010 Community Foundation of the Ozarks Humanitarian of the Year. In that same year, he was named the first Goodwill Ambassador to the United Republic of Tanzania. As he makes his way to the stage, please help me welcome entrepreneur, philanthropist, and one of the newest members of SIFE, Doug Pitt. Our next panelist is at the creative forefront of the business world and I expect will bring a compelling perspective to the discussion. As the executive director in the New York offices of Landor Associates, Karen Van Buren is responsible for strategic oversight and direction of the firm's corporate branding programs. She has more than 15 years of experience in brand strategy and strategic communications, during which time she's held leadership positions with a number of prestigious agencies and Fortune 500 companies, as well as running her own independent brand consultancy. She's helped shape some of the world's biggest and most well-known brands, such as J&J, &J, Johnson & Johnson, MetLife, UPS, J.P. Morgan Chase, m and Financial, and the Royal Bank of Canada. As head of brand management for J.P. Morgan Chase, Karen led the repositioning of the Chase retail brand and as senior director at Future Brand, she worked with UPS on a global repositioning initiative. This effort led to a, a complete global rebranding program that reached 340,000 employees and inspired the award-winning What Can Brown Do For You campaign and helped, the, helped UPS become one of the world's most admired companies. Karen is a native of South Africa, Cape Town in fact, and has degrees in marketing management, journalism, and foreign languages. Perhaps her most cherished personal accomplishment is the creation of the international design in Davo, which is the empowerment initiative intended to promote African design. The design in Daba is recognized throughout South Africa as the leading forum for creative interchange between business, government, academia, and civil society. Finally, I'm happy to tell you that Karen has recently been scythed, as we say, and her firm has been working with the, our worldwide staff and board to lead a global rebranding effort for the organization. Please help me welcome Karen. recognize our final speaker of the afternoon as he's the country leader of Saif Kenya. But what you might not know about James Shikwadi is just how incredible his personal journey has been and how highly regarded he is worldwide as a writer and commentator on issues related to development, environment, trade, and agriculture. Professionally trained as a school teacher, James was teaching in a rural isolated village in western Kenya when he came across an economics book. Intrigued, he wrote a letter to the author and so began a four-year correspondence that would change his view of the world and his professional trajectory. James became a self-taught economist and went on to found and serve as the director of the Interregion Economic Network of Kenya, a think tank that focuses on and develops ideas and strategies to enhance the quality of life for the people in Africa. He's also the founder and CEO of the African Executive, a leading online business opinion magazine that focuses on African issues. James Shikwadi has worked extensively with internationally acclaimed opinion leaders to promote ideas that improve productivity and increase freedom as a, a, and trade as a way to alleviate poverty. He's written widely on a variety of subjects for publications such as The Times, The Guardian, The Wall Street Journal, The Sydney Morning Herald, The Business News, The Daily Nation, and The East African Standard. Most recently, he's co-founded a book with Professor Jurgen Rungi, Ge uh, geological Resources and Good Governance in Sub-Saharan Africa. In 2007, James was named among the top 100 most influential Kenyans in a study that was conducted by the Standard Group, one of Kenya's leading media outlets. In their review, he was described as one person whose decisions and actions are not motivated by the publicity they attract, but by the passion for what they do. He was also recognized by the World Economic Forum 
as one of the 250 global leaders of 2008. Please help me welcome to the stage a man who's driven by the belief that free, freeing the human mind is the ultimate human capital. Please welcome James Shikwadi. Thank you. Rapendra, we'll start with you. It's okay, we'll just go down the line here. Yep. First question for you, beyond just seeking a traditional competitive advantage, can you talk about how large global companies like KPMG are reassessing the role they have to play in the future of the developing parts of the world, such as in India? You know, uh, the companies today are playing a far bigger role in society than they used to. And uh, they realize that operating responsibly and creating uh, stakeholder value uh, is in itself an enormous competitive advantage, apart from uh, contributing to broad-based development. Now, we carried out a corporate responsibility survey in India earlier this year, and uh, the results confirmed that business leaders realized the need to integrate social and environmental aspects within their business strategy. Now, it's only, not only global companies which are uh, uh, demonstrating this commitment, Large local companies are doing exactly the same thing now. Now, on our part, as a knowledge-based uh, uh, business, we realize it's our responsibility to build the capacities of the communities with it, within which we work. And uh, we encourage our people to participate in and lead these initiatives wherever they can. Now, I'll just close by saying that Professor Schwab from the World Economic Forum, he said that companies are now taking their place as stakeholders alongside governments and civil society. That's appropriate, and it's about time. <laughs> I think we'll talk some more about that in just a moment. Doug, we'll come to you next. You've got a really interesting perspective as someone who's both an entrepreneur and a very active philanthropist. It, seem you, it seems that you've woven those two things together very seamlessly, and I wonder if you could talk about that overlap and how they complement each other, uh, particularly how you your experience as an entrepreneur impacts your charitable work? I'd first say that I'm the same guy, whether my foot's in a, on a business decision or, or one of the philanthropic things, is throughout the day I am jumping back and forth. And I think that's one of the advantages that a, a business person has is that you've struggled over a payroll. You've been through the competitive bid process and trying to further your company and your product. You've had that interaction with customers and employees and the, the juggling that needs to happen. These things make you sharp, they make you better. And I think it's really important that uh, we understand, I don't, if it's a philanthropic entity, it's still a business and it has to be treated with that kind of acumen. And I think that's where many fall down in that we can have a big heart, but there, there are rules that are in play, whether it's for good or, or for capital, it doesn't matter. So. Uh, I'm that same guy. I, the same decision process. The same, you know. I have high standards for my business. I have the same high standards for those that we on our projects, and and it's it becomes result oriented either side. Yeah. So whether it's philanthropy or it's business or it's uh, government, getting things done is what is most important. I think if I had to define what entrepreneurism is, it's really working towards efficiency. And uh, I think as business people, we come to expect that, and we should. And so we, we want those same kind of results when we're giving up our time as well. Yeah. Very good. Karen, you work with some of the biggest brands in the world, like Scythe. Um, <laughs> how are the changing perceptions about the role of business in society and the emergence of ideas like the triple bottom line affecting how companies think about their brands, um, interact with consumers, and, and do you think these changes are positive?
We definitely live in a world that's increasingly transparent. And something you just said caused that to come to mind is, is that overlap of financial, social, and environmental work occurs as a business. If you can find that sweet spot where you drive all three, you position yourself not only to grow, but in an increasingly transparent world to be evaluated by potential customers and customers in a positive way. You're absolutely right, because technology has put the means of interrogation in front of everyone. So a couple of clicks of the mouse, and you can figure out whether a company is very credible in yeah. what they're saying or claiming they're doing. Yeah. I think it's a very powerful, positive force. Yeah. At Walmart, we've got 2.2 million people working for the company. And if one of them decides to do something that's not right, it is a real challenge for the rest of us in today's world because things, information, uh, moves so it moves so quickly that right. organizational culture and your purpose, I think, um, are very important right. today and, and going forward. Um, James, we'll come to you. You've written extensively about entrepreneurship as a means of empowerment and the most effective approach to fighting pervasive poverty in Africa. Would you please uh, elaborate on this? Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, of course, uh, I have to give a background in the, the situation in Africa where we have a continent that is really rich in uh, natural resources, minerals, what basically we say is sub surface wealth, but then we have uh, um, you know, uh, poor people. So uh, the connection here is to look at how can we get African people giving value to society and giving value to their own environment so that society can reward them and also the environment can reward them. Mm -hmm. So what entrepreneurship uh, is all about here for us in Africa is how to be able to gain the confidence to exploit the resources that we have in order to create the wealth that we so much need to make our livelihood better. And uh, you know, the, the element of confidence here uh, comes about through practice and through confronting the challenges that, that you are faced with. And uh, part of what we've been doing, especially with SAIFE, is to expose the, the future leaders and the leaders of today, not even tomorrow, to go through a process where they can go out there and meet the challenges and seek to solve them. And here, the big issue is attitude change, because unfortunately for us in Africa, our interaction with the rest of the world has been such that it created an attitude of expect somebody else to fix the problem in Africa. But what we're trying to do, and what I've been doing in all my writings and all my meetings, is to have that attitude changed so that we have more and more Africans who will seek to solve the problem or to confront the challenge as opposed to waiting for somebody else to fix the problem. Yeah. yeah. So Walmart recently made a decision. We have a script here, and I'm going to ignore that maybe for the rest of this whole discussion here. Walmart recently made a decision to invest some money in Africa. Um, we invested $2.4 billion to buy 51% of a retailer based in South Africa. And I presented to the board of directors along with my team why we should go and do that. And one of the central questions was, governance and how you think about sub-Saharan Africa, its future, and this idea that you purport, that you have written about, that, um, that the future of that part of the world is going to be even brighter, or brighter, we should say, than the past. Did we make a good bet with that $2.4 billion? I would say a good bet because uh, there's a lot that shows that uh, at the moment as we speak, uh, the global economy is relying on Africa for growth. Because if you look at Europe suffering standard growth, uh, the US saying maybe they have already achieved. Uh, so Africa is what is now the next push to take the world to the next level. You've seen even China coming to Africa, India as they emerge coming to Africa and Brazil. What that tells you is that Africa now holds the key for the next step where the, the world is going. And secondly, uh, there's the element of openness you know, creeping in Africa, because initially uh, it was sort of a closed continent. Yeah. But now the openness, I'm talking about, uh, for example, the recently signed Cape to Cairo free trade area, as bringing together 526 million people 
looking at an economy of uh, a trillion dollars uh, because the, the largest challenge for Africa has been connectivity and the mobile phone uh, technology has connected Africans more than ever before. You can talk to somebody in Ghana, in South Africa, all in one go. And we've got all the money transfer technology that now makes Africa more connected than ever before. And, and then there are what we call the economic hubs, around five of them in Africa, which now are seeking to interconnect. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking about the, the next frontier, in fact, if I use the word next, it's not good enough. I should say the frontier today <laughs> is actually in Africa. And then if you look at the human resource, uh, again, a, a tremendous growth, the middle class in Africa has grown to 313 million. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about Africans who spend between $2 to $20 a day. Mm -hmm. uh, we have 303 million of them. So there's lots of tremendous changes and a lot of openness in terms of governance whereby uh, more participation. If I used Kenya as an example, we just enacted a new constitution that is one year old and one of the key planks of this constitution is people participation mm -hmm. because a lot of the challenges in Africa has always been disenfranchised people not being part of government processes. Mm -hmm. But technology is now forcing governments to work together with people. And so it's all good news uh, despite the challenges. It's all good news in Africa because um, finally what I would say, we are realizing that our problems have n never been because of nature. I'll illustrate what I mean by that. Uh, for example, uh, you must have read in the press in the Eastern Africa, around two million people faced with famine, no food. Mm -hmm. And a lot of commentaries were attributing that to drought, lack of rainfall. But then upon reflection, we figured out that the problem was not drought. The problem was the lack of interconnectivity because of either uh, government issues. So here what is happening is that people are realizing that the more Africa gets connected, the more a lot of what we think are problems mm -hmm. will just evaporate. And you invest your time and energy in SIFE. I've been give, in give us an idea of why you think that's one of the ingredients to this success you're describing. Yeah, when I started the Interregion Economic Network in 2001, my focus was uh, uh, you know, to promote trade and intra-Africa trade. But then I figured out that there's no way you can trade when you have no product <laughs> to trade. And enterprise and entrepreneurship is what positions a population to be able to engage in value-added uh, productivity in order to have something to trade. Mm -hmm. And I've been now with SAI for nine years, and I, I can tell you for sure that it's a very, very powerful tool to expose young people to, to be able to see the need to make use of what they learn in school and to make use of their skills in order to bring value added products to, to society. Let me just illustrate by giving an example. I'll not mention the university because now we are in a competing environment, so I do not compromise the judges' views. But the point is that if you get young people going out there to the community, then identify a problem, total strangers, and then they're able to evolve a project that then transforms uh, the community's outlook to life by either adding value or packaging their product in such a way that it becomes more efficient mm -hmm. to sell to retail outlets and make more money. There are three things that you're gaining out of there. You're getting money, for example, in terms of wealth, but the key issue you're getting is the confidence. The community has the confidence to confront the challenge and make profit and make their life better. The young students are also gaining confidence to see that we can do it. And for me, that is very powerful. Yeah. And for the last nine years, it's always been good. Very good. Yeah. So, Rapinder, when you think about that and, and the, the students that are here this week, um, it's a big job. Many of them will be CEOs in the future, and they'll have to think through these issues, very broad views. So how do you think as individuals um, you need to prepare yourself, uh, for example, these students, to lead in an environment like the one we're discussing? You know, companies are now in the public eye as institutions, and uh, those who expect to survive and prosper in the long run are more likely to, be, uh, to act as responsible 
citizens. Now, there's a view that um, companies which uh, compete only on price will not succeed. And uh, the movement towards responsible business is influencing leadership uh, culture like never before. Now, the students here today are actually way ahead of the learning curve. They've learned to look at environmental, social, and economic factors uh, in business that, th that they support. And they focus on ways of improving the quality of life of project uh, beneficiaries. Now, we continue to be really, really impressed with the way that science students understand and apply principles that stimulate economic uh, growth. So there's not much that uh, they can learn from us. There's more that we can learn from them, really, in many ways. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's fascinating looking at the, uh, the projects that they work on and the enthusiasm that they have. It's quite incredible. Inspiring. Absolutely. So, Karen, people don't always want to believe this. Um, business has been beaten up over the last few years to a, to a large extent. So you know what these students are working on and you get insight through the work that you do into, into businesses that are trying to do the right thing and serve shareholders. How do you process um, how to communicate this in the future so that people don't perceive that it's PR? How do we think about reputation management? I think you never have a dimension of your reputation that you didn't do something to earn. And so that's maybe a little controversial to say it, but I think business has erred in this one area where it's been very one-way communication. So it's a matter of here's my PR message and I'm going to force that out to the world. I think the shift that has occurred that makes businesses and brands more sustainable is that there is a new order of engagement. So now when I'm engaging with my employees, I'm engaging with consumers, customers, I'm inviting them to see what I really do, mm. and I invite them to actually give me feedback on what I do. So this brings a degree of credibility to action that isn't just PR. It's, it's sort of a, it's a conversation more than a one-way sort of push. So I think the, the mitigating strategy that you're referring to to make sure that it feels authentic is to ensure that there is an opportunity for feedback, conversation, and I'm going to use the word co-creation, because the more companies invite their stakeholders to have a point of view in terms of what really matters to them mm -hmm. and what are the initiatives that should be supported, um, the more it becomes an organic partnership of sorts. And I think that that is what brings real, long-term, sustainable brand building. Yeah. But first, what I heard you say is you have to do it. You have to. Actions ultimately what? matter. Actions speak louder than words, right? So it's such an old adage, but it's never been more true. And in the world of branding, um, you know, the thought that you triggered with me, James, as you were talking, is companies are paying attention to their employer brands more than ever before. Mm -hmm. Because the people who are out there uh, demonstrating what the value set of a company is are the employees. Mm -hmm. um, and I think being very credible in that area brings another dimension to building long-lasting brands. So Doug, I'm wondering what, what you're thinking about this. You consult with a lot of different companies. You're involved in the field of technology, which is certainly changing how this whole thing works. What are your observations? As far as, it, you know, technology itself or? Small companies, big companies doing the right thing and also communicating that to customers. What are you seeing in, in your experience? Well, I think that's what I'm most intrigued about the Scythe student is they, they've got that ingredient or that, that intrinsic thing to get involved, and that's a spark that most, you know, don't have. Uh, that's the spark of an entrepreneur. That's, I don't care if it's technology. I don't care if it's retail or whatever the situation. Uh, that is the ingredient, and I think that's, uh, as I work with a lot of youth particularly, uh, you know, let's take a sector outside of something, uh, even in recycling. You know, it was my kids that came to me and were pushing us because we weren't really weren't doing the job at home that we should have been. You know, this is coming from a sixth grader at the time. I'm encouraged by that. Sometimes mom and dad need that little push. And in business, sometimes in business, we need that push too on a high level. Yep, brings accountability. Absolutely. So, Rapindra, it used to be that people would talk about their CSR strategy. Listening to Karen, it sounds a little bit more like you have one strategy and CSR is just kind of part of it, but as KPMG thinks about it and, and the foundation work that you've done comes to, comes to your mind, give us advice on, um, on what that feels like going forward as opposed to the more traditional way of thinking about it. You know, could I just start by saying that um, 
it's the best way of making money is not to focus only on making money. And that's, uh, there's, I think it's where Cornell Professor Stuart Hart who said that. And uh, that may be a debatable point, but uh, there are many reasons why companies should really uh, uh, lead the way in, 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 in doing this. Now, if you look at what we're doing, for example, in, in, in India, uh, we've got high growth. We've got, say, 8% growth. It doesn't reach anybody uh, below a certain level. And there's serious problems around that. So we really need to make a, a conscious decision to do everything that's necessary to help everybody. And that, I think, is a part of the strategy that companies need to follow today, that you can't leave people behind at all. If you, if you leave people behind, there's ultimately a price to be paid for it, I think. You know, we're learning that around the world as, as the world continues to get connected. Yeah. A lot's happened, James, just in the last uh, year as it relates to social unrest and, and other things. And, um, you know, government frequently gets tasked with the responsibility of solving those issues. But I wonder if you might talk a little bit about how you think government and business work together and how this thing moves further because they are collaborating. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's important to look at the challenges that confront humanity from what I would say two perspectives. The first one is a system perspective because some of the challenges, if I talked about Africa, would be about a scenario where we have a global system that for a long time has always uh, excluded Africa from being connected to it. Mm. So it makes it difficult even for entrepreneurs in Africa who want to, to, to scale up to be able to do so. But again, as the world gets more open, thanks to technology, because now we can discuss globally all at the same time without having to pass through any government official, what it shows is that uh, people then put pressure to change the system so that it can recognize that all humanity are here to also present a value to the global si system. Uh, so if that is taken care of, and that's now where we need governments to help us make sure they, they are right policies, mm -hmm. that they make it easier for people to realize their talents and, and maximize on their potential. But at the same time, there's responsibility for individual citizens that if you're going to wait for the global system to change on its own, or if you're going to wait for the government to do the right policy, then you might wait forever. So as an individual citizen, again, the, it's incumbent upon each one mm -hmm. to make sure that they also work hard to get out of a predicament that they might be facing. For example, if you're talking about lack of food or diseases, uh, all these happen to individuals. They don't happen to a government or they don't happen to a country. A country, you know, is just a mental uh, setup, but the individual is the one who suffers. So it becomes very strategic to have individuals having that pressure, that initiative. And that's why earlier I mentioned about confidence, mm -hmm. because if you don't have confidence, then it becomes difficult for you to be able to, to give that push in order to work together with the government. But now for business, uh, what I would say is that uh, because the business have got an interest that, that they're pushing, and this interest ties in into people's interest because if you were to, again, destroy uh, humanity, there'll be no business. You need people to consume. You need people to buy your products. Right. So the, the, that connection is very much in there because the government is there to represent the wishes and the interest of the general population but the business still is targeting that general population to give them a value in order to get a reward in terms of profit or what uh, we generally call money. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes imperative that uh, we, we get our people uh, excited enough uh, to see that uh, you know, they, they have got these God-given capabilities that they need to exploit to make their lives better and where possible make other people's life better if I give an example of uh, Walmart by ensuring access. Because part of the reason why we have uh, poor people is number one, there's no access to the products. And therefore, if we give access, then we give uh, a choice. And when people have choice, we, they have freedom. You know, and that's very important. We've figured out that as the population grows, seven billion, eight billion, nine billion people, and the raw materials on the planet are not accelerating at that same rate, that if we don't 
operate our business in a more sustainable fashion, we will eventually have demand problems. The math doesn't work out into the future. So we have to change to create, as we provide access, do it in a more sustainable manner to ensure the opportunity to grow in the years to come and the decades to come. Um, what I'd like to do now is open it up to, uh, to all of you. If you've got questions for our panelists, there's some microphones that are located down front here. If you would, please come down and, and fire away a few questions. And while I'm waiting for somebody to get to the mic, Karen, I'll ask you just one last question. You've recently been asked to help SIFE from a branding point of view, done some research, and as you've thought about that, I'm wondering if you might share with the group what you've learned about the SIFE brand and any other observations that you have. It's my most favorite current topic. And I think the word that I want to connect with is something that James has just said. For me, a total theme coming through everything that I'm learning about SIFE is that this is a story of potential and confidence. Because in the projects that you take on and in solving the problems in the community, you all see how to solve the problem. You see the potential embedded uh, in a situation. And the skills that you bring to bear and then the outcomes that you experience, not only personally but also at the community level, it's really all about confidence. It's an amazing, amazingly powerful force. So those are the two words that for me um, are very top of mind as it relates to, to SAIF. And then I'm going to overlay one other thing from a business um, perspective. Uh, when we speak to um, existing donors, but also prospective donors in terms of what do they believe sets SAIF apart from all the other um, initiatives that they can be involved with, and in fact, the answer, and I'll sort of abbreviate it on their behalf, is a forum in which it's possible to mentor, give back, realize their own personal purpose. So I guess my theme for the day is all about purpose because it's the answer to the question, why? You know, why should anyone pay attention? Why does it matter that we do what we do? Mm. Um, and I think it's a wonderful, wonderful um, mission to be associated with. Well said. I don't see anyone at a microphone. Do we have any questions? Is this a SIFE? Yeah. I'm just right wondering ahead. if we are actually at the SIFE World Cup. It's yep. a little quiet, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh. Just, just thinking. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, I just had a question. It's yep. working. Yep. I was hoping that, um, are you confident that in the future, corporate social responsibility, philanthropy, and strategic business will be combined into a model which will benefit both a corporation and the beneficiaries of philanthropy? Good question. I'll open that up for anyone who wants to comment. Absolutely, yes. And the reason that I say that with such conviction is that some of the big brands that are role models have integrated those two ideas and that business is social responsibility. In fact, I think the term social responsibility over time might actually disappear in favor of you know, what we do to advance our planet, um, our cause as a whole. I would yeah. agree with that and, and the fact that they're also asking questions. They're not coming in saying this is how you do it. We're big business. We know at the ground level they're looking at the people that are doing it, the, the people that are digging the wells, the people that are involved in the malaria or whatever the situation is on the ground. They're saying how do we do it? How can we help? I think that's a really strong approach where sometimes even as entrepreneurs we like to push more than pull, if that makes sense. So I'm intrigued, I'm intrigued, but I'm also extremely encouraged. I think as you said, Doug, uh, there's no way that companies can succeed in a society that fails. And uh, that is the key, because uh, there's a certain amount of, if you like, uh, enlightened self-interest in that. <laughs> exactly. From, from our point of view at Walmart, we like to put the market to work to create sustainable solutions. But at the same time, if we're not philanthropic in some ways, people don't know our heart. So you have to have, as we've said in SIFE, a head and a heart for business. And I think that's why philanthropy will continue and that there will always be some level of charitable giving. They can work together. Thank Do you have another question? No, that's right all. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amy and I'm from Australia. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity and everyone here. Uh, what I wanted to ask you was I've heard you speak about um, the importance of marketing yourself to employees because they come to a job 
with a value set and they don't want to work for an organisation that doesn't meet that. Do you believe that it's more beneficial for an organisation to focus on their internal people culture before they reach out to the community? Or do you believe that those two things can grow together? Hmm. Yeah, I think what Doug said earlier is, is interesting. He said, I'm one person, whether I'm doing this or that. And I think a company is the same way. So my answer would be, you really have to be true to who you are and your purpose. And that purpose has to resonate with the people that you want to hire as well as, as your customers. So what, what would you guys add? Anything? I would agree to that. And I think that's part of the stability equation too. We need to identify and know who we are as an organization first before we can tell the message and reach out to share that message or to bring people into what we're doing. So it all starts at home. Uh, I would thank you. Thank you. Thank Good you. question. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Tendai. I'm from South Africa. Um, in many parts of Africa, we still have regions that were divided for various reasons because of race uh, or ethical boundaries. My question to you is, where do you see brands as they come into Africa um, taking the power that they have to integrate people? Uh, a typical example would be shopping, for instance, where in some countries like South Africa that were divided by apartheid, people still move into the same shop, whether you're white, whether you're black, uh, whether you're colored. And so brands do have that transformative and integrative ability. So my question is uh, double-barreled. First of all, where do you see brands taking us in terms of that integration? Mm -hmm. And secondly, as brands such as Walmart move into Africa, are you changing maybe some of your models to suit, to fit in with that and to bring more prosperity as well as good by use of your brands? Very good question. Do you want to yeah. go first and I'll yeah. follow up? Um, I, I would say that, uh, first of all, uh, you know, there, there's that what I call economic empowerment. And, and when people are poor, they are automatically segregated from what I would say the, the good life of the world. And when I talked about growth in Africa, that to me is uh, one of the answers to the question. That the more we bring Africans into the higher income bracket, we will be integrating them into the global economic system. And then if I can give an example of, of a product that is uh, doing a great job in Africa, I mean mobile phones. You know, originally there were phones for wealthy people, but now we've got mobile phones that uh, even the poorest can be able to afford. And what that does is that it's a service that now cuts across all the classes. Now I look at product uh, delivery. Uh, to be uh, an element that can create that connection, whereby if we can be able to offer services to the bottom billion, offer services also to the top, all these people will be able to, to come together. Mm -hmm. and, and if we keep just uh, having a mindset or an attitude of we only target the high end of the market to the exclusion of the others, we've seen that it creates social upheavals. And therefore, I think the challenge here is that how can business then uh, be able to address a cross-section of the market uh, from the bottom to the top? And I think it's already happening uh, where we've seen companies repackaging their products uh, in terms of the wallet power of individuals. And I think for Africa, that's where we, we're coming from. Uh, we've seen for banks that are trying to also scale down up to the lowest person to ensure that they also enjoy banking services. Uh, and then we've also seen uh, in terms of even the agro-business that also repackage their products, not only for huge plantation farmers, but also for small-scale farmers. Yeah. And to me, that's a, a good way of getting everybody connected. Yeah. Um, James, James mentioned earlier how important it is that people have access and if I give you a retail answer specifically um, what we want to do is have the right stores the right size the right technology as things increasingly are, are done um, on mobile devices etc to be able to serve everyone and the market opportunity for us at middle income levels and and below is tremendous um, we, we were walking a store recently in Guatemala and the opening price point that we needed to have there, our, our lowest price point on a push broom, was not low enough. Um, in Mexico, we sell a very inexpensive push broom, 
but in Guatemala, they took the broom head off the stick and sold them individually. And the reason is because they could reach a lower price point and it was frequently the stick that was breaking and the customer only needed to replace the stick, not the broom head. And they'd enabled access at an entirely different price point with basically the same broom. So in emerging markets in Africa and in other places, you'll see us um, evolve the store size, the cost of the store, and even the items we sell, like the example that I just mentioned, so that people have access at the lowest possible price while getting the right level of quality. Um, our purpose is to save people money so they live better. And the idea is that if we can save you money on that push broom, you can use that money to invest in your child's educa education or to put food on the table or whatever else that family needs to do. But they are the ones who should decide how to invest those savings. And that's the way that, that we think. Good uh, question. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, just in conclusion, I would like to say that uh, a lot of talk happens uh, with regards to transformation in Africa. And it's good that business is coming together. And hopefully if all of the efforts that business and SAIF students engage in actually do take root in Africa. We should see Africa as the current frontier. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In, in, um, in your generation, you're going to find, as, as we've learned in these interconnected times, that you can't leave anyone behind. The, tr the visibility that everyone has into everyone else's life, if it creates this pressure that if we don't find ways that everyone can participate, increase their levels of income, take care of their family, it's going to create in increasing levels of pressure, but it doesn't have to. Um, business, government, and others can work together in a way that will make this, this world in the future an even brighter place. Let's take uh, one or two more questions. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for this panel and, of course, for this opportunity. My name is Marijk Spielberg and I'm from Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Uh, my question uh, is about corporate so social responsibility. Currently, corporate social responsibility is evolving much more into corporate social involvement. And um, speaking in the Netherlands, we have uh, a lot of partners who are interested in becoming actively involved in our projects, for example. Could you, perhaps, from Walmart, give an example about how your employees or uh, are simulated to become more socially involved? Um, sure, but I'll invite others to do it as well. Um, we, we do a, a lot of different things. One of them is we have something called a personal sustainability plan. And when we, um, a few years ago, launched our efforts in the, in the areas of sustainability that I mentioned earlier, we challenged each one of our associates around the world to adopt their own sustainability plan and get involved in their community. Little things from water conservation to their own health, or in some cases, partnering directly with SIF teams and others to help further their own projects. So it's this, uh, this exponential idea that you can do one thing as a company, but if you, if you, light, if you uh, encourage and empower your associates to step up, you can light up things around the world through your own people individually. Any other comments on that? I think uh, what we tell our people is that uh, uh, we don't want your money. We want your time. We like you to volunteer. And uh, we do this either as pro bono projects where uh, we build uh, capacity for the community in which we operate, or actually just individual volunteering or individual mentoring, for example. But you can't institutionalize mentoring, actually. It's got to be individual one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a great response from people because that's the way they like to do things. I mean, anybody can give money, but giving time is far, far more important. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. One more. Hi, my name is Medina and I'm from Australia. Um, my question stems around the area of what happens when social responsibility doesn't correspond with companies' bottom line? For example, in the case of, say, patents around HIV medication. Anyone care to comment? Sometimes, you know, the, the bottom line does come first. We worked on a product with a company to, to develop a product that was 100% distribution uh, in the philanthropic sector, 100% of it. Then the economy hit and it got pulled back. And you know, unfortunately, that's the realism, but it doesn't change the culture of the company. The desire is uh, they've got a responsibility to shareholders to a bottom line, but the heart of them is there. The mission's there to move forward and make a better place. And 
I have the chance to work with a lot of Fortune 500 companies, and I love the creativeness that, that uh, they're trying to develop and in, in doing things different for good. Uh, one example, I'm working with one right now where they do a lot of research that they would job out, and the idea was we spend all this money getting people in a blind room behind black glass. What if, and here was the deal, we started working with charities. Charities put the panel together. Charities hosted it. The companies come in, they do their, reg their research with real moms, real consumers, and the charity benefited. And so they were actually using corporate dollars to get the research they need, but at the same time, fulfilling a mission and helping a local charity. And they're doing this with, from all the way down to a cheerleading group at a high school to national NGOs creative. That's good stuff, and I love to see the pursuit. So I don't disparage anybody. The bottom line is important. We got to, they have to feed their employees and take care of, of business, but at the same time, even negotiating through the economic times that we have right now, I love the heart. I love the mission. That doesn't change. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, because I know the, the question of patents and access to antiretroviral drugs, especially for Africa, has been a big uh, Bit. I think there's normally the need for balance uh, where we have gov governments that are focused that can then create a balance with the co uh, corporate uh, bodies. I say that because I know, for example, in India, they, they used to push for the, you know, no patents. But now when India stabilized in the pharmaceutical industry, they are now pushing for patents. It's a very interesting kind of cycle that uh, sometimes w when you are outside the loop, you feel like I should do without patents in order to enable the access. Mm -hmm. But I think the key word here is, uh, is that if the governments can work together with business to ensure that element of access is taken care of, because all this is about access, then uh, I, I think you can have an amicable uh, way of ensuring that we, we don't let other people suffer just because maybe one side needs to make money. Remember what I said earlier, you will not make money if humanity is perish, because it's people that <laughs> make companies get the profit that they need. So yeah. we need to have uh, governments doing their right job in order to make sure that the corporates also respond accordingly. One of the things that, that we've learned is that if we try to solve a problem like that internally, we frequently lack the expertise or the perspective to be able to solve those trade-offs that, that you were describing and letting others in, whether it's NGOs or in some cases divisions of, of governments, to help us solve those problems, our own supplier base, for example, we actually make more progress and some of the perceived trade-offs that we had before go away and you realize that there are ways to do more than one thing at a time if you have the right people in the room discussing the issue. It takes partnership and cooperation and teamwork. Doug, can I add one thing? Sure, can. It takes something that Doug actually mentioned. The theme of the session is creativity. The most powerful question is what if? What if we think differently? Mm. Invite a different audience. To creativity is unleashed and different solutions emerge when we ask what if. Yeah, very good. Listen, before we leave, imagine yourself as being their age and one of these students here this week. And just each one of you quickly, any advice you have, if knowing if you could ch change uh, with them, trade places, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give them as a young person? Would you like to go first, James? I, I would say from the African perspective, now that we are the ones dr driving the global economy in terms of growth, we've got the resources, everybody is coming for them. And, and, and uh, the danger being that uh, Africa as a continent may develop, but the African people may not develop. Um, the, my advice would be, uh, we've got this uh, uh, challenge, uh, what I'd call a job description, that we have to ensure that as Africa develops, African people too must develop. And I think as SAIF students, uh, that's the, the work we have to do. And that's the confidence that I'm so happy that we, we are having as SAIF that we can go out there to develop, grow ourselves, and grow others, and make uh, Africa grow not just in terms of the continent, but the African people. And I think we've got the answer in the audience here, and I'm so happy about it. Thank you, James. Yeah. Karen? Thank you. I do absolutely mean this sincerely for me. Go big 
or go home. Because life is too short and the problems that we have to solve on the planet are too big to think small. I would just let you know that the invitation's there. In business and in social responsibility, you have a place at the table. It's yours for the taking. And uh, I think you've made the right step. And the fact you're, you're ciphers, you've stepped up, you're doing above and beyond already. That's the ingredient, guys. That's what it takes to be successful. Good start. My advice is very simple. Just do the right thing. If there's a balance between the head and the heart, I'd go more towards the heart. Very good. Well, listen, the uh, opening round competition award ceremony will begin in just about 10 minutes. But if you would, please thank all of our participants for the panel today. Thank you very much. Nice job. Thanks, Shapendra.